A very big hello and welcome to all participants joining us today for today's webinar on negotiating with your banks. This is proudly brought to you by the Central West Local Land Services Ag Team. We have had a fantastic response to today's discussion and webinar topic, and we really do appreciate the fact that so many of you are joining us today and interested and engaged in this topic. So we really do look forward to hosting you and uh, having a really positive and productive discussion. I'd like to extend a really warm welcome to Brad Sewell from Robertson and Sewell Partners. Brad will be today in, the, in his discussion, taking us through understanding farm finance, negotiating with your banks in this post drought period, and also giving us some more information around interest rates to arm us to make smarter decisions for our businesses. Before we get into today's webinar, I'd like to go through some introductions and also for those people that haven't uh, come through this webinar software portal before, just go through a few housekeeping um, processes just so you can also engage in today's webinar. So I have the pleasure at being your facilitator today. So my name is Wendy Gill. I'm the mixed farming officer based in Central West Lo Local Land Services based in Forbes, where I'm currently joining you and broadcasting from today. Co-facilitating uh, with me today is Neralee Brennan, the Ag Team Leader for the Central West Local Land Services. And Neralee is based out of Dubbo. If you do need any help, with any of the technology today during the discussion and the webinar, please feel free to contact myself or Neralee. Both of our numbers are listed at the bottom of your screen currently. Um, we'll do our best to try and work through those technology difficulties with you. And during the later sessions of this particular webinar, Neralee and I will co-chair the question and answer time with Brad. So we are really looking forward to that session. In terms of the housekeeping and control panel options for yourself, so on the right hand side of your screen, you will all see as the participants um, your control panel. This allows you to actively participate. You can use the collapse and expand button currently highlighted to remove or engage with the presentation and discussion throughout, throughout today's session. All participants will be currently muted and today's webinar will be actually recorded for future resources use or for you to come back and have a, another listen to should that be your requirement. We will today be also having a question time so you can submit your questions and comments at any time throughout Brad's presentation. The questions in the question box will be gone through one by one and we also have the option today to also have the raise your hand function. Now, if you have a really good quality microphone and also if you have some reliable internet service, please feel free to use the raise your hand function. I will unmute you and you can ask your question directly of Brad. I will then put you all back on mute just to ensure that everybody has some good connectivity and are able to participate and engage with the questions that you've asked. So I'd really encourage anybody with those services to raise their hand and we'll try and get across as many uh, of your questions today as we can. In terms of today's webinar format, just to advise all our listeners and audience today, so we will be taking the, taking the presentation from Brad, which will go for about 45 to 55 minutes. We will then have a question and answer session this has actually been extended for this particular webinar as we are really uh, conscious that there are quite a lot of engaging questions from our audience and we really wanted to facilitate a time where you could actually engage with Brad directly to do this so we've allowed for about 20 to 25 minutes should the need arise if those questions are there from the audience uh, in today's session we will then move into a wrap-up and talk about some future events as well so I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker, Brad Sewell. So Brad comes to us with 30 years of professional experience in the rural and business finance sector. He has had major roles as 
a specialist rural lender and has worked with prominent banks and provides independent finance advice to primary producers throughout the country. He started Robinson and Saul Partners in 2010 with his business partner, Ian Robinson. This business has has worked hard to develop strong relationships with agribusiness owners and operators. And Brad is really well known throughout the finance industry and has built a superior reputation based on his business model and also his attention to detail for rural agricultural businesses. Brad underpins his finance and banking experience with a lifetime association with working within agriculture across beef, sheep and cattle and cropping enterprises in New South Wales and also over Queensland. He has a significant grounding and keeps himself very well versed and up to date in the agriculture sector through also owning his own mixed farming property, which is based out in the central west of New South Wales at Ningen. And we are extremely happy to have Brad speak to us today. So I'll hand over to Brad and to start today's discussions on negotiating with your bank. Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, very exciting day to be able to present um, this uh, um, presentation, uh, which uh, there is a title, How to Negotiate with Your Bank, but I like to call it, You Don't Get What You Deserve, You Get What You Negotiate. And the last time I was able to give this talk was in March 2018 at Condoblin. And um, between then and now, it's been nothing other than a, a, a drought that has got in the way of farmers' capacity to negotiate uh, with their lenders. So it just hasn't been uh, the right time over the last couple of years to sit down with your bank and, and, and talk about negotiating and, and seeing if there's better terms. <clears throat> um, however, uh, if you're... Uh, um, in the fortunate position of having had good rain in uh, recent months and um, you've got stock fattening on, on pasture and, and crops going in as I do out at Ningen, then we're heading into a, um, a great opportunity to uh, talk with your, um, with your lenders uh, um, in the near future. So. Um, great timing to be able to give this talk and uh, let's uh, get stuck into it. This Just by note, this isn't a bank bashing um, presentation. Uh, this is about working constructively with banks and, uh, and you know, the banks I think have been quite admirable over the last couple of years supporting farmers during uh, this very ordinary period that we've just been through. Um, I was a bank manager in the early 90s when we had drought and 20% interest rates and uh, uh, <clears throat> the way the finance industry has handled itself in the last couple of years is to be commended. So having said that, <clears throat> um, you know, we're all in business and banks are in the business of lending money and making money out of that lending and uh, you need to um, be in the business of, of uh, running a farm <clears throat> at the same time minimising costs. So uh, Rightio, next slide please, Wendy. Okay, so just to give everybody a little bit of background, um, there's a map of Australia and that's pretty much uh, the sort of area that we cover. Uh, we do have clients in Western Australia, South Australia, Northern Territory, Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, don't have any in Tasmania, but uh, in the 10 years at Robinson Sewell, Partners has been operating. We have um, advised and represented uh, farmers in over $650 million worth of um, debt negotiation. Uh, and that's a combination of um, acquiring finance for property acquisition and also um, just negotiating better terms uh, for, for clients. Um, and that's predominantly built around interest rates um, because that is where the real cost uh, tends to be in finance. Um, the $70 billion figure you see on the screen, that's that's where farm debt is at present. Um, it's um, it's up a, up a fair bit, as you can imagine, from a few years ago when it was about 52 billion, and that's largely been driven by um, the farm community's need to borrow more to get through the last couple of years, two to three years of drought. And I do appreciate that quite a number of you 
um, or some of you might be from Western New South Wales or other areas where it is still dry. Um, I've not long returned from Broken Hill and Tipperborough and Bow Ranald, so I know what it's like out there. And I had seven years um, as a bank manager and rural financial counsellor in the West uh, in the West Western Division. So um, uh, hopefully there's some good rain out there soon. But um, 70 billion is roughly where we're at at the moment in bank debt, and um, the main areas of Australia just so. You've Got a bit of an idea where the bulk where, where there's some big debt areas are western australian grain belt followed by the darling downs followed by the queensland outback which is predominantly the beef cattle industry uh northwest victoria which is always quite surprising um look quite that's the uh the, the fourth biggest um, farm debt area in australia then we get northern new south wales which is your big dry land irrigated um, grain and cotton growing areas and then at number 12 is uh, New South Wales Far Western Arana, um, which many of you um, are probably listening in from. So um, the biggest debt industry is grain um, at about 30%, 36% of farm debt, um, uh, followed by beef, uh, and then um, sheep and beef combination, dairy, cotton, vegetables, etc. Uh, New South Wales, uh, it's um, grain is uh, the, the largest um, industry in terms of debt, and we can all imagine how that why, why that would be particularly the case after the last few years. Um, so that's just a little bit of a backdrop of where we're where we're coming from. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please, Wendy. Okay. So what is missing in agricultural finance from a farmer's perspective? <clears throat> well, in our opinion, it's, it's three things, and they, they actually go in, in, in synchronised step. The first is knowledge. Um, the reason we continue to have work, rain, hail or shine, is because people come to us, not, not because they, um, they're not intelligent, it's because they don't have the time um, or the knowledge to understand whether they are in a, you know, what, what sort of deal they've got from the bank, is it the best deal they could have, could they be getting a, a better deal or do they need help buying, you know, sort of representing or positioning themselves for the next property acquisition. And the best way I can explain this is um, a bit of an analogy around farmers are very good at buying um, vehicles and machinery and uh, for instance, Quite often I see a client spend probably four or five days buying, say, a, a, a new Hilux ute. So they'd spend the first two or three days ringing around. And if they're in Dubbo, they'll ring Dubbo City Toyota. Uh, they'll ring Black's Toyota in Toowoomba. <clears throat> they might ring um, the Toyota guys at Casino on the North Coast who always seem to do good deals. And they might give one other Central West, New South Wales, uh, dealer a call and I'll do those calls you'll send photos of your trade in Hilux and and then ultimately you'll make a decision as to who's going to get the business and that might take two or three days of phone calls etc um, you ultimately decide to go to Black's Toyota in Toowoomba and um, so there's a drive you drive a day up you stay the night have a nice night out pick the car up in the morning do the trade and then you're back so there's a total of five days and you come home happily knowing that you've Saved yourself about fifteen hundred to two thousand um, dollars compared to if you if you'd bought maybe locally. <clears throat> then we look at finance, which is the biggest cost in agriculture. Um, it's always in the top three. It generally the cost the cost of interest in your business is only ever really um, surpassed if you're a livestock producer and you've spent a lot of money on fodder during a drought. Or if you're a grain grower and you've just um, and you're putting a lot of money into this year's crop, that's generally when uh, the cost of interest is outstripped. But other than that, it's generally always number one cost. Yet it's the one that typically never gets addressed. And we're going to look at a case study today that I'm on a deal that I'm actually working on right now, just to show what can be achieved with a bit of time. So it's that the knowledge without the knowledge, you lack the motivation to do anything. And because you lack the motivation, you don't put the time in to trying to work out, you know, is there a better deal out there? Is there a better way I can present my case? So, you know, that's what's missing in finance. I'm going to give you, and today's going to be 
about giving you some really good insights into what's going on in finance and how you can position yourself to have those discussions with, with your lenders. Next slide, please, Wendy. Okay, and because you don't have knowledge, um, you open yourself up to two big risks. One is called funding risk. Um, I recently had a couple who um, their debt was just short, it was half, half a percent short of 70% loan to valuation ratio, which is the amount of debt as a percentage of their land value. Now, um, the most you can get out of a bank is 70%, okay, generally. Um, go over that and banks start getting uncomfortable. This couple had no idea what the what what the implications were of being so close to the limit. They were actually they contacted me and asked me to get in there and negotiate a better interest rate um, for them with their bank. It, it 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 actually sort of turned right around to me saying, "Well, no, you need to, <clears throat> you know, this is all about you surviving." Uh, and, and actually maintaining the support of your bank. This this is no you're in no position to be negotiating interest rates. Everything you negotiate with your bank should be around maintaining their support. So not having knowledge can sort of put you in a difficult situation of asking for something that, that really isn't there to be had. The other the other big bit that's um, that, that from a lack of knowledge is the cost of funds. You know, am I on a good interest rate or, or aren't I? And, and I can tell you now, the majority of farmers in Australia are not on the interest rate they could be if they negotiated their position properly. So let's move into it. Thanks, Wendy. Next one. Okay, <clears throat> so we're at a barbecue and uh, there's three, you know, there's a group of farmers, there's three guys standing around, three farmers standing around the barbecue. <clears throat> um, there's always someone that would like to talk about interest rates and um, it's generally uh, Arthur or A for Arthur um, because he, he knows he's got the lowest margin um, in the market. And Arthur starts a conversation and, you know, tells his two mates that he's got a 1% margin and, um, you know, he's, he's, he's negotiated a really good deal. <clears throat> and then uh, Arthur turns over to, over to Brian and says, Brian, what are, you, what, are you, what are you on? And Brian says, well, I'm on 1.4% margin. And, and Arthur and Charlie, the other guy, sort of say, oh, geez, that's a bit steep. And, um, and then Arthur and Brian ask Charlie, well, what are you on? And Charlie says, well, <clears throat> I'm on minus 3%. And they go, well, how does that work? And Charlie goes, oh, look, I've got no idea. I was told how it worked a couple of years ago and I've forgotten. I wouldn't know whether I was on a good deal or not. <clears throat> so here's the three guys talking about margins. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Wendy. So Arthur's 1% is actually on top of a base rate of 3.96%, which means he is actually paying 4.96%. Brian's margin of 1.4%, which appeared on face value to be dearer, is actually on a lower base rate which means he's on 4.1. Charlie, who had no idea what he was on, has a base rate of 6.35, but you take 3% off that, and that's 3.35%. So, and these are real numbers. These, these are numbers I've, I've picked up out of my portfolio um, this week and just adjusted the base rates according to where we are at the moment. So the moral of this slide and the previous slide is that margins are absolutely irrelevant. They're quite honestly, they're probably one of the most useless bits of information um, you can sort of uh, rely on in terms of knowing what your interest rate actually is. It's just margins are nothing more than a part of the sales pitch that 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 you get from and and the way that banks price their debt and how they present it to you. It's just part of a presentation. None of those numbers there in front of you in either the margin or the base rate represent what's actually going on with the cost of money in the market, not one of them, okay? There's no relevance at all. They're just numbers used for marketing. So just out of interest, <clears throat> um, Arthur's actually um, in real life has a reasonably, you know, over three, four million dollars debt, is, is very high equity and has good cash flow. 
okay, what you would consider to be a strong operator and has maintained that strength and cash flow even through the last few years. <clears throat> Brian, the second one down, is a young guy um, who's just started out uh, in agriculture, has good off -farm, some good off-farm income, but um, low equity because he's just bought his first property in the last 12, 18 months, uh, and, um, and but reasonably good cash flow. And it's only a small debt. <clears throat> it's un under half a million dollars, and he's getting a better deal than Arthur, who's been around a lot longer, is a bigger debt, and is in a lot stronger position. <clears throat> and then you've got Charlie, who is uh, down the bottom, who is actually high equity, but poor cash flow. That deal's actually located in a semi-arid area, um, which is not typically aligned with you know, good interest rates. But, um, and so you can just see the total inconsistency of these three um, farmers. And, and really, it all comes down to negotiation. And Arthur is the client that I don't represent. I am now, and that's the case study we're going to go on to. Brian and, and, and Charlie are existing clients of mine, okay? Next slide, please, Wendy. So if I was in a room full of people, I'd ask you all, what are these numbers? This 0.14, this 0.15, this 0.25. <clears throat> um, but anyway, I can't do that, so you can't answer. Someone might know it out there. But this is the cost of money as at 10 a.m. on, I think, Tuesday morning when I uh, updated this slide. This is the cost of money that basically banks um, base their interest rates on. It, I've never seen rates as low as what they are now. They, they, now, a bank could argue that there's, you know, they've got to add a bit of um, um, capital adequacy provisions in there, and there's, there's a, you know, the, the Treasury Department within the bank's got to take their cut, et cetera, et cetera. But this is fundamentally, when I, th there are certain banks that quote, quote this rate um, when, they, uh, when they quote on clients' business, um, but this is the cost of funds. So when I talk to clients, and if they're on 4.95 or 4%, whatever it is, um, this is where the conversation starts, is where is the cost of money relative to what they're paying? Um, we, you know, we're getting some pretty good rates at the moment for our clients, um, but don't worry, there's still good money in it for the banks, okay? So that's the cost of money. You can actually get this information from the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, it's ASX, um, and it's called the, B, the BBSW, Bravo, Bravo, Sierra Whiskey. Okay, um, and you you can pull up a, the last I think it's the last ten days rates for anywhere out to about twelve months. Okay, so this is the cost of money. This is where you start your negotiations with your banks. Thank you, Wendy. Next one. So here's a case study I'm working on at the moment. Okay, oh it's actually not a case. This is a deal I'm working on right now. Um, it started a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, $3.5 million. The clients just sort of felt, you know, having watched all the news, seeing what the Reserve Bank's doing, they're sort of wondering why are they on 4.96% when they're in such a strong position. Good equity, good cash flow, and they're on 4.96%. So they engaged my services. I wrote up a tender document, which we call a credit paper. I'll give you a few insights into that in a minute. Um, I issued the tender out to three selected banks and three selected bank managers. Okay, it's very important that you know who to approach, but you can do it yourself um, by just talking to you know friends and neighbours, you know, um, as to who they deal with, whether they've got a good bank manager or not. Um, we keep, you know, we have a block book of pretty much everybody, um, certainly in the eastern states, or bank managers who, who the go-to people, the people, the bank managers that are are passionate about ag, they're in that 35, 45 range, they've got you know, kids in a mortgage, they're trying to hit their targets so they can get a bit of a bonus at the end of the year. Um, they've, got enough, they've got enough experience in agriculture um, uh, to be able to represent the banks and to be able to um, 
articulate your position to the credit team. They're the people we go to. So this tender started last week. Um, we did we did um, inform the existing bank that uh, the clients were effectively just having a look around. Um, and within about four or five business days, uh, uh, the current bank dropped their margin from 1% to 0.35. Um, now, the incumbent bank doesn't have access to the tender documents, but they know who we are and what we do and how we do it. And they know that we always, you know, and, and so without any, uh, <clears throat> well, apart from the fact that all they were told is that the clients were having a look around and they'd gauged my services and they've dropped the margin from one to, to 0.35. So the clients are at 4.31. Now, on Monday night, I received a quote from another bank and you can see it there, alternative lender came in at a total of 2.45% all up, okay? That's, you know, that's where those clients really should be at the moment. It is a good rate. Um, there is another, there's a, a line fee, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that gets added onto the um, the facility. But it's, you know, we used to think probably three or four months ago that a rate that had a three in front of it was a really good rate. Pretty much all our clients now have got a three in front of them, except for that um, for Brian at the barbecue who's on four point uh, what was it four point three or four point one, and that's because he's 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 just started out. It's a small loan, low equity, right up there um, on the you know at the limit of the bank security. But basically, all our clients have got threes in front of them, and quite a number are moving into the twos. So um, I am waiting on two more quotes from alternative lenders and um, and just be aware the process it's not about changing banks okay it's it's 90% of the people that engage my my services aren't wanting to change banks they just want a better deal from the bank they're with okay so it's i don't i'm not out there to make people change it's um it's if if the existing bank can come to the party and offer offer a good deal well, that's great we stay because 90% of the time people are happy with the relationship that they've got um, however um, you know sometimes the incumbent bank just doesn't want to budge and and therefore a, a another lender has that opportunity to to pick up the business okay so, so there you can just see what happens in a tender process okay now um, so how did this play what, what what are the actual savings so three and a half million dollar term loan the current lender say 4.96 because that's where they were before the tender started um, on a fully drawn basis that's one hundred and seventy three thousand six hundred dollars in interest the alternative lender at 2.45 percent there is a line fee there of nine thousand dollars which applies to the limit but even having taken that into consideration the interest total interest drops to $94,500, which is a saving at this point of $79,100 per annum, okay? So we talk about spending three, four, five days shopping around to save a couple of grand on a Hilux. Um, this couple, like everybody else we deal with, um, have probably put about three hours work into this tender, and that's basically probably be about two hours worth of teleconferencing with myself and about an hour of sending financials and other bits and pieces of information to me by email. And here we are at this point, we haven't finished the tender, but we're, we're already at a $79,100 per annum saving. That's per annum. So if you go three years, we're talking over $200,000 in savings over three years and it just keeps going, okay? Um, now, this is not about me promoting my services. This is about me telling you what is achievable, okay, and understanding how finance works. Next slide, please. So, you know, quite often when people first ring and say, look, we don't think we're on a, as good a deal as we should be, um, but we don't want to upset the bank because you know our manager's a really nice guy and we like him and you you can't have your cake and eat it okay you have to this is a business transaction all business transactions come with uh, mutually respectful and agreed terms but the fact of the matter is you're borrowing money and you're paying for it and the bank's lending you money and they're earning money for it 
and the fact that your bank manager is a great person that's that's great that's 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 quite often that can trump interest rates but only to a certain extent but when you go into it when you when you go into a negotiation with your bank you just have to put that relationship aspect aside okay it's um there's lots of good bank managers out there um now the case study i just did with you um the 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 bank that quoted 2.45 percent all up for that three and a half mil deal that bank manager is going out to meet those farmers tomorrow um, that bank manager knows that he hasn't got the deal but he's just going to give it his best shot and you know at this point the, the clients may end up staying where they are because their, their existing bank will hopefully come to the party um, but i typically find that farmers or pretty much anyone in business they might be prepared to pay ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars more for their existing bank um, based on relationship. But once you start getting past that, um, it, it's hard to ignore the savings because what typically happens is once you get over about twenty thousand dollars, the wife can see a new kitchen or a new bathroom, and it's all like <laughs> it, it's always the way the wives jump in real quick when there's a saving to be made. Um, it's, it's, it, it can be the difference between being able to maintain boarding school, being able to keep your kids at boarding school or not, especially when your savings get up around forty, fifty thousand $50,000 a year. Um, the wives usually have the first two or three years of savings allocated before the husband even sort of gets in to start talking about new, you know, some better quality bulls or rams or whatever. So it's um, just take the relationship off the table. Don't be fooled by the fact that you know your bank or your bank manager may shed some crocodile tears about being put under perceived pressure to come up with a better deal and the deal they've given you is the best one they've given you and that every other client's on the same deal it's just not the case the cost of money today is about 0.7.17 of percent that is so close to zero it's not funny that's the cost of money that's where you sort of put the relationship aside and say well yep we enjoy your relationship but really you know there's got to be a discussion we actually find that banks respect the borrowing client uh, more once they've been through this process whether you do it yourself or you use someone else like us you'll gain more respect because at the moment there's too many farmers where the bank's getting not only the cream but they're getting the cherry on top because you know you haven't negotiated and you haven't negotiated because you don't know how to negotiate because you don't have the knowledge but um yeah so there's lots of good bank managers out there i mean i know that this couple that i'm working i've got lots of deals on at the moment but this couple who've got a bank manager going out tomorrow are going to really like this bank manager because all our bank managers that we work with are really good operators so the incumbent bank is going to be under pressure to perform okay um um, the incumbent bank is no, going to know that they're not only up against a, a really good interest rate, um, but they're up against a really good bank manager. And you put those two things together, and you're in a, you are in a strong position to negotiate. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Next one. Now, just um, managing finance in adverse conditions. Look, quite a number of us have jumped out of adverse into into some pretty good conditions but um you know so a lot of my clients uh, one in particular is very good at keeping their bank informed whether there's a drought on or you know a really good season that they're like they're going to experience at the moment you know keep your bank managers informed um whether it's good or bad times it doesn't have to be long-winded it could just be a, an email to say look received a, another 40 mils of rain the other day, moisture profile full, 50% um, um, of sowing complete, season's looking good. Um, you know, just, just whether it's good or bad, keep your, keep, cause bankers are typically conservative by nature, okay? And they, so they therefore default to worst case scenarios. If they don't know how you're tracking, then they will typically default to the worst case scenario. So even if there is a drought, just, you know, just, um, you don't have to tell them every day you're in drought, they know that. But if there's any sort of light at the end of the tunnel, just let them know. Always know what your financial position is, okay? It doesn't matter whether it's good times or bad times, just 
And that's in terms of, you know, what are your assets worth? What are your liabilities? What's your equity? Um, always keep cash flow forecasts up to date. You know, I've got a client, you know, one of my clients, he just, he always wants to know where he's going in the next six months. We're always doing cash flows, okay? Um, probably every three to four months we update the cash flow. Always know where you're going. Um, have your financials done, okay? So just be aware that banks technically can't make a decision on a property purchase or um, a request for additional finance if you don't have your financials done by the 31st of December each year. So for the 2019 financials, which is um, the financials that cover up to uh, June last year, you have to have them done by the end of December at the latest. You can't click over onto the 1st of January and then ask a bank to support you on a property acquisition or a major increase in debt to put this year's crop in or whatever. It makes it, makes it difficult if nearly impossible for a bank to give you an answer under the current regulations that exist. Okay, so I know everyone's accounts tend to be busy, but it always comes down to who screams the loudest. Okay, so you, ideally you should have your financials done by September, October. Um, and if it's because you haven't done, you, you finished off your books for the financial year, we'll make sure you get them done. Um, you know, have a production and a finance strategy. So we're going to talk a little bit more about timing of um, these type of negotiations. Um, but, you know, always, it's, it's not only knowing what your cash flow might do, it's also looking at, um, you know, where your production's going and, where, you know, where your finances are heading. Um, always know what your property values are. Um, quite often, um, you know, people tend to either be too conservative or too too high. Uh, um, referring to, you know, comparable or to sales in the district, which may not necessarily be comparable. I, I was a registered real estate valuer for quite a number of years. That's how I got into banking, by working for banks valuing their security. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard to find out. If you're a bit unsure, just talk to your local real estate agent, um, but always know where your property values are because that tells a bank, or tells you and it tells a bank one key thing and that's where the, what your security position is with the bank. And then presentation is key. Presenting yourself and how you do it to the banks is absolutely critical and that's going to be the next phase um, of my talk going forward now. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, what to present? Well, there's a few key things. The first is what we call a credit paper. Um, and for all the deals we've done, and some are large, you know, 40 million, um, 20, most of our deals are probably around the two to $5 million mark. Um, we always write, write what's called a credit paper. And it's just a document that summarizes um, your financial position in terms of the information that's important to banks, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's not about the name of the dog or the horse or anything like that. It's just a very concise document. Um, typically, mine don't go for more than four, five, A4 pages, but it just summarises all the key points about your business. And I'm just going to go through them, um, some of the key ones, one by one. Um, I think this is being recorded, this webinar, so you hopefully can go back over it at some point. Um, so it's a Word document to start with, um, and you just start by who is the borrower. Uh, now it's not, it's not um, um, Anthony and Kate Citizen, it's uh, Anthony John Citizen and Kate Aubrey Citizen trading as uh, a and K citizen, ABN number such and such. Um, who's your accountant? Just the name and the location of your accountant. Most bankers know the accountants in each, each district. Um, who is your current bank and where are they based? So it could be, I don't know, uh, NAB, Dubbo or Agri, Agribusiness Dubbo, or something like that. Doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Just a brief description of your business. Um, and I mean, I mean pretty brief, like one or two paragraphs at, mo at the most. And it could be um, uh, um, 
the borrowers or the, the clients own and operate a mixed farming property 50 kilometres northwest of Dubbo. Uh, the husband um, manages the farm and has some off-farm casual labour. Um, Kate is a registered nurse and works at Dubbo Base Hospital. Uh, the clients run um, 500 uh, merino ewes um, and jet program involving a thousand acres of cropping. Um, <clears throat> Neighbouring property has come up for sale um, and would fit well into uh, the client's long-term um, plans. Uh, so therefore this credit paper is an opportunity for um, your bank to uh, quote on a, a, a property acquisition and for the existing business. That's about the extent what you um, what you have to put in. Then you put in a historical income table and that can just be a simple Excel spreadsheet with um, for instance 2019 column, 2018, 2017 column um, along the top and then rows um, down the side, sheep, wool, cattle, wheat, barley, goats and then you just fill each of those boxes in with the with the income that you earn for, for each of those um, income sources. Okay, it doesn't, that's all it has to be. Because what you're doing is you're actually saving the bank manager time. And time is critical to everybody, including bank managers. They are typically uh, less resourced now than they have been in the past. Um, so this is just not a presentation thing, this is a time thing. This is you, this is literally you versing everybody else, every other client trying to get the bank manager's attention. Okay, and you'll get the bank manager's attention if you put in front of them a concise four or five page document that covers off on all these things. Um, so you just you list what your current loan facilities are, um, which is you know maybe a fifty thousand dollar overdraft and a five hundred thousand dollar term loan, and then you and then you might have requested. Then the next the next um, point is um, requested loan facilities. So it might be need an extra $250,000 to put in this year's crop or another half a million dollars or a million dollars to buy the neighbouring property. But again, you start with the overdraft, list the existing term loan, and then you put another, say, $500,000 so that at the end of the day, a bank manager can say, okay, this is what you're borrowing now and this is what you want. Um, you know, you have to be clear about what you want. Um, just list the security being offered, offering a first mortgage over our existing property and, and, and uh, plus a first mortgage over the purchase property. If it's a property acquisition, um, talk a bit about your cash flow forecast, and I'm going to give you some pointers on cash flows on the next slide. Um, tax office debts. Now, this is where deals come undone, um, particularly um, refinance or, or, or when you're tendering your business out to get a better deal, uh, or you're buying a property. So, if you've got tax office debts, pay them off because they're a statutory charge. They rank in front of bank debts. They're, they're, they're right up there with council rates. Okay, so if you've got a tax debt, it, it's, a big, it's a big red flag for, for any lender, your existing lender included. Um, you now, you could be, you have been with a, a bank, the same bank, for 20 years and be putting, you know, putting your hand up for some extra funding to get through this year. Um, and the you know, the bank might say, oh, we want an ATO portal state. And, you know, all of a sudden it's shown that there's $20,000 or $30,000 debt there. Um, you have to address that. I, I generally won't take a deal to market unless the tax office, you know, is clear. Okay, unless there's a good reason why it isn't. Um, bank account performance. If you're going to other banks or talking to other banks as a way of leveraging better deal out of your existing bank. Um, the other banks will want to see six to 12 months of bank statements and, and if those bank statements uh, have got dishonours, um, uh, say equipment finance repayments that have been rejected by your existing bank or you've been over your limit for 30 or 60 days on your overdraft, that can raise, well it does raise a red flag and you, you have to explain why that happened. Now part of the part of the process we go through with our clients is to look at you know why these things happen and is there are there valid reasons that we can use to to mitigate another bank's concerns and it might be 
and the classic, I had a classic not long ago, a client's, um, uh, I think it was three and a half thousand dollar repayment on a vehicle was rejected by their existing bank. <clears throat> Yet the clients actually had 30, just over $30,000 cash in a, um, one of the, you know, in a, one of these interest saver type accounts. Um, and unfortunately their bank dishonored the repayment without checking to see that it could have been paid by credit funds in another uh, related account. So we were able to offset that in our presentation to some other banks, but um, bank account performance is is key and um, you need to explain if there's been some out of orders. Uh, obviously your assets and liabilities, that's stock standard in these sort of presentations. Um, make sure you use realistic values. values. Don't um, don't go too high, don't go too low, um, you know, just try and pitch it roughly where the market is um, um, and include, you know, in assets, you've got to include cash, shares, um, superannuation. Some people say, oh, I don't want to put my shares in there because that's, um, that's uh, um, you know, we don't want the bank taking that. Uh, the bank's not out to get your shares, but if they know you've got them, then they know you actually have some very liquid assets that you can call upon should you need them. Um, I mean shares can be sold and paid for within three working days. Uh, superannuation, the bank don't, the banks don't want your superannuation but they, they like to know if there is some there because in you can actually access super in financial um, um, need and we're seeing that in the current situation at the moment where the government's actually allowed people to take superannuation out. So put those in there, list all your liabilities, your equipment, finance, your farm loans, your personal loans, your credit cards, you have to put your credit card limits in and your balances, um, all that stuff. Um, your background, just give a brief background yourself. Obviously Kate's a registered nurse um, and you know, and just, you know, Anthony might've been to, to uni and done a Bachelor of Agribusiness or and, and Bacaroot in the North. Um, just put those simple things in so that um, if you, you know, any any new bank that you're talking to in a shopping around type of arrangement, uh, they can get a bit of a feel for who you are and where you've come from and, and what you've done in your, in your past. Um, list your any life insurance. Again, that just tells a bank that if something happens to one of the partners and the other partners, you know, got some sort of financial capacity to, um, to keep things going while they're dealing with grief and, and, and everything else that has to go on in that situation or it might be just simply a partner who's badly injured or gets sick. So um, yeah, list those things down and if you haven't, if, you, if you're reasonably young and you haven't got any life insurance, it's well worth looking into. And then you just finish your deal off by saying, look, you know, um, we'd appreciate the bank looking at our deal. We believe it's well secured. We have good cash flow. We're hard working. Um, we're respected in our district. Um, for our integrity and our honesty, and we have a willingness to repay debt. Okay, so um, the face-to-face -face workshops I run, um, I do, I do. I'm happy to do a sample. Um, I do issue a sample credit paper, um, but um, and uh, yeah, we can sort of maybe do something there. Um, so anyway, at the end of the day, these credit papers they save the bank manager time, um, which means you'll get an answer quicker. Um, and it increase, increases the probability of getting a positive answer. Okay, if you do the job, do the job properly. Next slide, please, Wendy. Okay, cash flows, do's and don'ts. Um, use Excel. Okay, um, Microsoft Excel. It is the it is the recognised format for presenting cash flows. Now, <clears throat> I know Phoenix does a great job and there's other cash flow formats out there, but the problem with Phoenix is that I can't change it. The bank manager can't do anything with it. Every time one of us wants to do something, we've got to ring the client or send an email and say, oh, can you do, you know, change this or that. Um, Excel is, you know, sending, doing a cash flow in Excel is something that I can play around with to just test the, the test the deal and just see how it looks if commodity prices take a, a, a bit of a hit or or interest rates go up and that's what banks like to do as well. They're not going to change your cash flow and say that's the one you submitted but they like to play around with them in the background and just see how the deal looks. So use Excel, okay. Um, maybe 
I don't know whether you, these days you can transfer Phoenix into a spread, an Excel spreadsheet, but um, yeah, um, always try and have a cash flow on one page. Okay, two pages vertically at the most. There's not much. Um, again, you're trying to reduce the time the bank manager's spending on your transaction. Okay, but if they have to print up six pages and three going down and two going across um, and sticky tape it all together to work out what you think you're going to do. You, you're wasting their time and you're just making it more clunky. So I have never done a cash flow um, that is more than two pages vertically. Um, and in fact, 90, 80 to 90 percent of my cash flows are all can always fit on one page. OK, um, and it's actually not hard. It doesn't even even, you know, I've got clients that have got irrigated cotton, dry land, farming, cattle, you name it. There's lots of income and expenses, um, but it can be done. You've just got to keep it simple. Um, no zeros, okay? This helps keep the cash flow down to one page. You might have got a cash flow forecast off somebody that's got enterprise related income and expenses that don't relate to your business. Just delete them. OK, um, if you have zeros in there, then the guys, the credit guys in the bank will come back um, via the bank manager and say, well, why is there a zero against this expense? Has it been an expense in the past that you no longer have or what's the reason? Um, the, the reason was it it's just it's not even a relevant expense. So get rid of it because you, because then you're avoiding these these delays in in, in answering um, questions that never needed to be um, asked in the first place. Uh, make sure you've got income and expense rationale in the cash flow. So lots of people do worksheets on the side where they they have a separate worksheet that says how they arrived at their sheep income and their wool income. I prefer to put it in the actual cash flow Excel. So you, in the income line, you would just simply have something like 2,000 uh, hectares of wheat at two and a half tonnes to the hectare times um, $250 a tonne, bang, done. And you put the number in the in the month that's relevant. Okay, sheep, um, 500 weathers at $150 a head, bang, done. Put that in the month. Um, wool, you know, 100 bales of wool at uh, $1,200 a bale, done. Put it, if you've got it in the cash flow, the bank manager's only got to look at one one page, one or two pages at the most to get the picture, and you do the same with the expenses. You know, if you've got a decent sized cropping operation, you might, you know, actually put your um your harvesting costs on a per 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 acre or per hectare basis. Okay, so um, always make sure there's a closing balance at the bottom. <clears throat> now, most cash flows I get from clients have the total income and the total expenses, and the income. That, sorry, the profit or loss for each month and for the year, but they very quite often don't tell me what the closing balance of the bank overdraft is going to be. It's really important that your existing bank or, or a potential new bank can see where your working capital position is. So, for instance, you know, just working on a cash flow this week for a client, um, our closing balance said that. Um, the, the the overdraft's going to be up at around the 1.3 million dollar mark, okay? And the client's only got a limit of 1.2. So, it, and but this is not going to happen for probably another three or four months. So we've already put it to the bank and said, look, it would appear that in this month we're going to be short about 100 to 150 thousand dollars. And is the bank ready to um, provide a, uh, a what we call a temporary overdraft or potentially a permanent? increase until the end of the year when we get some grain income so it's really important and and you might in this client the way the season is um, and they're experiencing a good season is they'll peak out at 1.3 million but they could end up in credit by quite a substantial amount at the end of the year with grain sales and banks love to see debts clear or not debts but overdrafts or working capital accounts clear so if you've got an overdraft that says well we actually need more money but at the end of the year we're going to pay it all back, then you're going to get a, you'll have a far higher chance of getting that um, that temporary OD or that increase if the bank can actually see that it's going to clear at the end of the year. Um, ensure your cash flows are consistent, okay? Um, in income and expense, don't you know? Be careful of look. You can you can you put a million dollars of grain income in this year and you've had nothing in the last three years. That's pretty easy to explain. But if you 
if this was another year on top of some normal years we'd just had and all of a sudden your income's up 50 percent you have to explain why you're achieving the extra 50 percent is it because a great amount of your country is going into cropping or or what or, or you're running more stock or what whatever it might be and the same with expenses so be aware that at the moment the banks are testing they're reconciling in your cash flow expenses against your last four three to five years and 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 if you if there's discrepancies, say fuel, you put in at 50, but it's traditionally been 75 or 100 grand, they will ask why is there a difference, okay? So make sure you've got yourself covered there. Banks are also using 10-year commodity price averages for any cash flow that goes beyond 12 months. If you're doing a three-year cash flow, um, you need to um, you need to pull some of your maybe pull some of your livestock values back in the second and third year. You can't go putting three hundred and forty dollars on news eighteen months out from where we are today or two years out from where we are today. You have to bring them back to long term realistic because that's, the banks will test the income. Okay, you can get away with current current commodity prices in a twelve in the next twelve months, but going out beyond that, you need to um, be a little bit more mindful of what what commodity prices have been doing over the longer term. Um, and why do you have to do cash flows? Well, they're absolutely essential because as a, as a bank manager will always tell you, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. So you won't be held to account for a cash flow, okay? I've very, very rarely seen banks pull clients up because a cash flow wasn't achieved. But you do have to do them and you, because everybody wants to have a bit of an idea of where you think you're going in the next 12 months. Particularly if you're talking to new potential new banks, um, no bank at the moment will take it on, on anybody unless they have an idea of where that business is going. Okay, uh, next one, please, Mindy. Okay, nearly nearly up, running a bit over time. <clears throat> last, pretty much the last oh, on the second last slide. Okay, um, lenders' do's and don'ts. If you're buying a property or you've got your business out to tender, just, just follow up on the other bank managers once a week, not every day or every second day. Um, typically on a Monday morning or a Friday morning, um, not Friday afternoon when everybody's just thinking about a weekend, Monday mornings are good because bank managers have had time to rest over the weekend. Um, email your information to bank managers. Don't walk into a branch with three to five years of financials and tax returns and cash flows and credit papers and ATO portal balances and you know 30 pages of bank statements in hard copy okay it, you need to scan it and email it by all means meet you know the bank manager face to face but um, and, and give them a copy of the credit paper and your cash flow but when supporting information it has to be email because banks have to scan everything has to be electronically held now. And if you give them everything in hard copy, you just you're loading them up with a lot of work. Okay, they've got to sit at a scanner for half an hour to an hour, probably unbinding your financials, which everybody dislikes with a passion, um, trying to get your 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 key information into a an electronic format. So always email that stuff through. Um, you know, confirm by email key points of telephone discussions. Um, so particularly. If if you're buying a property, the, the the excitement and anticipation that people have when they're trying to buy a property is that you can misconstrue a conversation with a bank manager about what they think about your deal. So always follow up shortly after with a brief email and say, Kate, thanks for your time today. Our understanding is that you have all the information required uh, and the deal looks positive at the moment. And Kate will come back and say, yep, no, don't need any more information. And um, yep. Um, deal looks positive, happy to support it. Or she might come back and say, well, no, that actually wasn't my interpretation. I'm still waiting on X, Y, and Z, and um, and all this is a tight deal. Um, I've seen, you know, people have come to me with deals that have unraveled because they misinterpreted, um, you know, where they were. They've gone and paid a deposit on a place when they really didn't have the finance approved, or, or they've paid a deposit on a place when they thought it was, it was all okay, but it wasn't. Um, be concise in communications. Don't waffle. Just yeah, answer the question um, professionally. Um, don't go on holidays when this is all about you know when you when you when you've just started this process. Preferably don't start this process before you're planting or before you're just about to start shearing. You need to be ready to respond 
um, when the questions come in from either the existing bank or potential new banks. Okay, um, bank managers will only hold your file open for so long. If you if you take a week to get back to them, they've probably shoved it at the bottom of the pile by the time you get back. Keep the deal going. So be ready. <clears throat> when the bank managers come out, you know, make sure the place is clean and tidy as best as can be. You know, it might be hard for a couple of hundred thousand acres or even a thousand acres, but the the, the front driveway. And the house and the yard and the and the sheds, um, just you know, reasonably clean and tidy. You will be judged um, like the like the cover of a book. Okay, um, it's um, you know, bits of wire lying along the driveway is not a good look. Um, a five hundred thousand dollar header in the sun when there's a nineteen fifty six Holden that you've been meaning to do up for the last twenty four years is sitting in the garage is not a good look. Okay, it sort of tells bankers that you got your priorities wrong around you know what what assets should be looked after more than others um yeah and dress according to the meeting location just um you know when you go into the in to meet the, the manager at the branch by all means wear your rb seller stuff and make just make sure it's a clean a clean a clean set and and, and not a sweat sodden set of clothes that you've had um when the farmer comes out on farm with the bank manager comes out on farm yep yeah, just you know, it doesn't have to be Sunday best, although some people do do that, but just, you know, again, um, if you're going for a drive around the farm, make sure your ute's reasonably tidy, no wrappers, McDonald's wrappers scattered around the floor. Um, yeah, you will be judged by the way you present yourself. Um, so just following those simple rules, you'll minimise the bank manager's disruption and improve their impression of you. And finally, last slide, information, it should be concise. It should be as accurate as you can make it, and it should be relevant. Okay, it's um, that's why we always get away with four to five pages in our credit papers. It's it's just we just tell banks exactly what they want to know. Um, when um, yep, next slide, please. Andy, I think there is actually one more. Yeah, when to present your case. So, <clears throat> right, just because we're running out of time now. Um, if you're a grain grower. Actually, it doesn't matter whether you're a grain grower or a livestock producer at the moment or a bit of both. I wouldn't be negotiating interest rates until you have your crop in and germinated, okay? Because banks are looking for more certainty. Now, we all know there's good moisture around, but we, we just after the last three years we've all been through, we need more certainty. So we need you need to get your crop in and it needs to germinate. And I'm getting photos today from my share farmer of my crops that have germinated out at Ningen. And once you've got those crops up and there's still some good moisture, um, and assuming we continue to get some moisture, because you're flat out at the moment anyway, so there's no point trying to do this while you're running around on tractors and everything. Um, get your sowing, get your get your sowing done, and then look at your position. You'll be in a far stronger position to sit down with a bank and talk about interest rates when you know you've got a crop germinated. The same with the graziers, okay? Wait till you know you've got enough feed to get through winter. Okay, so we're, we're sort of still got some warmer weather. Um, the feed should be still bouncing out of the ground. Um, you could probably start to have some discussions now, but I'd probably just give it another six to eight weeks, just, just sort of the drought wasn't that long ago. I know we're, humans are good at moving on in life, but just give it a little bit more time and then potentially engage with your bank manager. Um, deferring principle. Um, if you just want a deferral principle, you're always going to have to do a cash flow forecast um, as part of that, that that request and you're going to have to, you might have to get evaluation done if it's pushing you up towards your limit. Um, a lot of clients we're seeing are up, you know, up towards the limit of the bank's LVR. Um, and extra working capital, if you need extra working capital, you just got to get into that now. That's, I'm doing a lot of work for existing clients, cash flows. Again, you have to do a cash flow um, and a bank needs to know, you know, how far, how much you need and, and how it's going to be paid back. Right. I think that's it. Thank you. Is there another, one more slide there just to finish off what I call the 20? Yep. So this, so 20 is 20 minutes. So if you've got, if anyone wants to run their scenario past me, it takes 20 minutes on the phone. I mean, I have clients at Camerwheel, Alice Springs, um, just settled on a job on Monday at Innisfail. Um, yeah, so look, you know, within 20 minutes I can determine 
whether you're on a fair and reasonable deal or whether you're not. And if you're not, then we talk about whether we need 120 minutes on farm um, or extra work to, um, to, 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 to address that situation, okay? And there's only, you know, this is the wrong slide for, a, for an environment where we're not supposed to be meeting each other face to face, but, you know, 20 minutes on the phone and 120 minutes on farm, um, the only thing I ask is for a cup of tea. So it's um, when I get there. So, you know, I look forward to hearing from anybody that just wants to run their situation past me. I, I kid you not, 15 to 20 minutes and I'll know exactly where you should be, okay? So it's been a pleasure talking to you all. Um, I look forward to some questions and um, yeah, um, we'll go from there. Wendy. Thanks very much, Brad. That was uh, a great presentation and and by the looks of it, uh, we've got some really strong engagement um, from our audience as well. So just while I um, change back to some screens there, um, while we've got the time, so I'd invite all participants and audience viewers today, um, now we're moving right into question time. So if there are any burning last minute questions you'd like to type um, into the chat box or ideally the uh, question box in your, in your control panels, um, now's that time to um, to pop those in, and narrowly we'll um, we'll go through those shortly. Um, I'd just like to quickly pull your attention back to some um, upcoming some upcoming uh, little housekeeping components of today's webinar. So straight after the webinar, we would be asking all participants to attend to our um, rating feedback survey. So it's a quick two minute survey that will get launched directly at the end of our presentations. And it is directly to give both uh, Brad and the Central West Ag team some feedback about what you thought of today's presentation, but also um, some ideas of if you've got some further ideas about other future events that really would uh, enhance your business decisions and or um, it might be some technology, Excel spreadsheet support, etc., that you might be interested in. So I'd really um, appreciate if anybody that's listening today uh, or anybody that also receives the video uh, as a recording later that uh, isn't online, there is that opportunity to engage in that survey. And um, for anybody that has to duck off quickly um, this afternoon, that uh, survey will also be linked with any uh, follow-up um, emails from, from a lovely lady called Michelle, um, who will send you an email in the next 24 hours to all our participants today. So Brad and I are really keen for that feedback and I appreciate the time and effort from the audience in actually um, sending sending that information in to us as well. So we'll go through some questions. Um, we're going to do our best. We do, we do have a number coming in at the moment. Um, so we'll go through our questions. So Brad, I might just ask you our first question. It's from Tim. Uh, he asks, which is the best bank in your opinion? And possibly a, a very short answer as to why, the context behind the why as well. Thanks, Brad. Uh, yeah, um, thanks, Tim. Look, a bank's only as good as the bank manager you deal with. So we don't, we don't bank, we don't um, back particular coloured shirts representing different banks. We, we focus on, um, the people that work within the banks and quite often, you know, um, uh, that you, you might be 10 kilometres away from one agribusiness manager and 100 kilometres away from another agribusiness manager within the same bank um, and we would seek to maybe engage with a manager that's 100 kilometres away because in our opinion that's the person, that's the manager that's right for your business. Now, we can typically get away with that because just our position in the market, our reputation, it is hard if you try to bypass someone more local yourself um, um, to, 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 to do that. But look, a bank's only as good as the, the, the people that um, they put in front of you. So um, I can say that in some areas of Australia, I, there, there are some banks I just won't deal with because they don't have the right people yet. In other parts of Australia, they have the best. They they have the best proposition. So um, it's all about the people you're dealing with. Thanks, Wendy. 
so now I'll just ask Nerali to go through some of the other questions. Nerali, um, welcome online and um, yeah, uh, have you got another question there from our audience today? Yeah, great. Thanks, Wendy. And thanks, Brad. There's been quite a few questions come through, so we'll try our hardest to get through as many as we can. The first one comes in from Brock. He's just asking, um, what steps could you outline, Brad, for young farmers who are trying to buy the family farm or aspiring farmers looking to get onto the land um, in terms of their financial literacy? Ah, oh, right. Okay. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Brock. Yeah, look, I, um, um, I I did do a webinar this week for young farmers on exactly that subject. It's it's a big topic. I, I just I can't think of how I can answer it so succinctly now. Um, what I will tell you is that um, I am talking to Wagforce in Queensland about doing a similar webinar for young farmers, and it is look, it's it's 45 minutes answering exactly what you want. So. Um, and uh, New South Wales DPI Young Farmers Program in obviously in New South Wales. Um, I've been doing roadshows um, on that around the state, and I did the the, the, the webinar on um, Monday night. Um, so yeah, too hard to answer at the moment. Um, just keep your ears, keep your eyes on New South Wales Young Farmers because that is a topic really targeted at what you at what you want answered. Thanks, Nero. Yeah, thanks, Brad. It might be a really good idea, Brock, if you um, are able to access on the internet and just Google the Young Farmer Business Program um, and link in with them because they are a fantastic resource. Okay, the next question I might ask, uh, Will asks, is it a good time to fix interest rates, Brad? Yeah, look, it, it certainly can be. I mean, they're, they're as low as I've seen them in the 30 years I've been around them, and I think they're they're low. You know, they're as low as what they've been, even beyond my time. So it's uh, this. They certainly are well worth looking at. They're not fixed rates aren't a lot dearer than um, the variable rate. So um, you know, one two years are only marginally dearer than variable, and and three years might be or oh, half a percent dearer than the current rate. Um, but if you're looking at fixing, um, you really need to look at your at, at your overall rate with the bank because once you've locked in, you can't come to me or you can't do your own shop around um, for a deal because once you fix, there are penalties incurred for, for for getting out. So don't lock in until you know whether you're on you're getting the best rate for you from your bank. Okay, so it's um, but no, certainly well worth looking at. I, I Traditionally, for the last seven or eight years, not advised my clients to look at fixing because I've just had that that experience gut feel that says they were just going to keep falling, and they have. But I, I'm at that point where I'm saying to clients, "Yep, yeah, have a look at it now." Thanks, Nerilyn. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Another question, sort of along that same line, Emma's asking if you have part of your loan fixed, how long um, out from changing that? variable should you start negotiating or engaging with your advisor or your bank? Uh, look, I mean, you could, I mean, you can't really do much about it until the day it rolls over and who knows what rates are going to be at that point. Uh, but you could start having the discussion maybe, you know, six weeks, six to eight weeks out from when it, when it, when it rolls over. The case study I gave you today, the three and a half million dollars, there is a fixed loan component within that that um, that uh, doesn't expire until the end of next year, and we've calculated what the break cost is going to be, um, which is going to be about twenty-five thousand um, dollars. But when you look at the fact that clients going to be saving over seventy thousand dollars a year. Um, they're probably going to accept that break cost, relock that same portion in for a lot less fixed interest, um, and 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 so that you know, so they're breaking that because we might get to October next year and rates are moving up, and so you, you know people could miss, um, you know, um, sort of locking in at these historic lows. I don't know how much lower they're going to go, um, 
um, they can't go, you know, I don't know, there's no such word as can't, but yeah, look, it's um, certainly just keep your eye on it. And if you're already locked in and at sort of a fair bit higher rate now than what you could what you could get now, then you might actually even just look at the scenario, the run the numbers on paying a break and relocking in, because you'll, you'll regain that break cost over time. It just depends how long it'll take. Thanks, Nero. Yeah, great. Thanks, Brad. Um, Renee's asked a question. She's recently had some informal conversations with um, her bank and they've offered a 0.2 of a percent decrease. How do you determine what a good reduction is? Um, and when do you go to other banks? Um, honestly, without even knowing the situation, 0.2% is what I call a token, a token response. Um, it's the classic, the 0.2, the 0.25 is the classic, you know, if a bank's offering that, it makes me think they've actually got a lot more to offer, to be honest. Um, that is just the, you know, and they probably they probably they may have given it they might have given it with a bit of crocodile tears, but um, it's it's look everybody could ask their bank for a reduction, and everybody will get quarter percent. But you saw the case study we did, where we've gone from four point nine six down to two point four five. We're talking two and a half percent reduction. We're talking ten times the reduction. To a 0.2% reduction, um, to the 0.2% that, that's just been asked. So, I'm, look, I might, I don't know anything about the, this person's position, but um, typically that sort of offer by a bank would indicate to me that there could be there could be more or a lot more on the table. I just did a job for a big Queensland family, and um, they decided to run the tender themselves and. They did, they got three quarters of a percent off. Um, and I told them all along that they, they would should have been closer to 2%. And so then they engaged me and sure enough, I got the extra 1% off. It was actually 1.1% more that I achieved under my process. So they got they got the first 0.75 and they should have because they were a very, they're a very prominent family in Queensland. But um, yeah, we took it, took it to a new level. So yeah, I, I don't know that I'd settle for 0.2. That's, the, that's my answer. Great, thanks um, very much for that, Brad. So we actually have a uh, live question from Sue Knowles. I'm just going to uh, switch to Sue now and actually um, take her off mute. And Sue, hopefully, um, if we can, if we can see if um, Sue can hear us at all um, and come on live to ask her question. No, we seem to um, seem to not. Sue's um, stuck on mute. Um, Sue, if you're listening still, if um, if you can just engage with us um, as well, and we'll try and get you back online. Um, Nerily, we might go to another of the uh, text questions if that's all right. Yeah, radio, not a problem. The next one for you, Brad, comes from Kylie. She said uh, the new need for re-evaluation of rural properties. Who should pay, the vendor or the bank? Um, is this a negotiable item? Uh, yeah, no, it is negotiable. Look, uh, you know, some banks do valuations internally at no cost to the client. Some banks do them every three years at cost to the client. Um, it's, it just depends on the strength of your business. Again, it's not only interest rates that are up for negotiation, it's these, all these other things like um, valuation fees, um, other fees and charges, it's things like, you know, does does the bank really need security over all the property? The case study, of, again, the case study I did today, those people own four or five places and there's more than enough security on four of the places. So we've actually, that the, the, the first quote that came in this week at 2.45% actually excludes the property on which the family home, home is located. So you start getting into these, um, 
you know, sort of um, other benefits of a negotiation. But certainly with respects to valuation, um, it depends on, you know, your equity and your position, you know, how strong you are and, 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 and you can, you ask the question, you ask the bank, well, look, we've paid for the last two valuations over the last six years. How about you guys um, cough up for the next one? And they might say, oh, I don't know, and maybe try and get 50% out of them. Um, yeah, but it, it doesn't have to. You don't. It doesn't have to be that you have to pay. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Wendy, how many more questions do you think we can take at this point, just so I keep us to time? Yeah. So we might just have one or two more, if that's all right, narrowly. And um, we we are coming towards the end, so um, we'll try and uh, just squeeze in one or two more, if that's possible. Yep. Great. I'll just, uh, we'll ask the question early on, is paying back a debt on a new property purchase within 15 years realistic? Uh, no, not really. Um, no, 15 years is just a loan term that banks, you know, look, everything's negotiable. You can you can start a loan contract today and, and circumstances change and you might have to renegotiate it uh, with, um, within you know a couple of months we had one in just before christmas in central australia and i think we settled uh, just before christmas and and then the clients actually needed more money like within weeks of settlement and yeah i just sort of thought oh geez this is probably not the best start to a relationship but um but we rene renegotiated the terms and the bank was really good and you know we explained well we had a good reason for why that was the case but no look um Banks do 15 years mainly just to determine whether potentially you could do it. But um, yeah, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen in 30 years anyone pay a loan out within 15 years because you're always wanting to do something. You're wanting to buy a bit more land or, you know, you're wanting to improve the property you've got. And so the loan just keeps getting extended or it might get bigger or, or whatever. So no, don't don't hold it as being hard and fast, but it is technically how banks look at the deal when they're, when they're judging whether they want to take you on or take that deal on. Okay, they do work on 15 years. And a large part of that's to do with the regulations that banks are under with, um, you know, the, the authorities like APRA and ASIC. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Brad. Thank you very much. Um, that's going to pull up our question and answer session. I thank all of you as participants and Brad for a really engaging session. Um, I apologise if we haven't managed to cover your question uh, or topic area in the uh, in this question and answer time. We have had quite a number um, come through, which is really great to see. So, um, so I'm just moving on for the wrap up of our presentation. Um, just if you'd like to get in contact with Brad, um, his contact details are currently being shown on your screen at the moment. Um, please feel free to um, have a discussion with Brad. If you would like to contact myself or any members of the ag team um, at Central West Local Land Services, um, my contact details are here in regards to feedback for today's event or um, certainly our, all our team's um, contacts are and locations of offices are also located on the Central West Local Land Services website as well. Now, while, um, while we're just coming to the conclusion of today's webinar, I'd also like to bring to the attention to the audience some opportunities and upcoming events for the Central West Local Land Services region. Um, so we have the, in the ag services side, we've got the Central West Local Land Services Fungi online discovery and identification workshop about to come up in the next coming weeks, which is on the 5th of May. So if anybody would like to engage in this new format of online workshops, um, they will be using the program uh, Jitsi to run run the, the program and uh, for the day. So it'll be for two hours between 10 and 12. And if anybody would like further information or to RSVP and to get the registration details for that uh, software portal, they can contact Rowan Leach. So Rowan's details are also currently listed on the screen as well. Uh, those event details and um, particularly those flyer details are also uh, currently being advertised on our events website.
page as well. We also um, have the opportunity as well, some upcoming events for the ADAPT project, which is an ag teams initiative project looking at some further business management events that are coming up. So if you'd like to register your interest in some of these events around business management, which is supported through the ADAPT project. So this looks primarily at different focus areas of um, people's enterprises around cropping, soils, pasture, feed bases for livestock, as well as the climate and the business focus. Um, we're running some upcoming events up in into June and into um, into the next financial year. So Pip Doolan, the project manager, would certainly be happy to have a chat to anybody who might be interested in seeing what, uh, what events are available and what format those events will be rolled out in the coming weeks. So we hope to see a number of producers engaged and um, present in those different types of events across the coming weeks. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you all for taking the time to participate in today's event. We do hope you found the information really useful for your own business. And I'd like to again thank both Brad Sewell for his time today and his explanation, which was excellent around the negotiation um, and dealing with, with your bank and how to set up that component of ensuring the best possible outcome for your business and also to Nerily Brennan for her assistance in co-facilitating today. I really look forward to hosting and engaging with you all again in future local land services, ag services webinar events and I thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much. You there, Wendy?